Chapter 14 of Up From Slavery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Preston McConkie. Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington. Chapter 14. The Atlanta Exposition Address. The Atlanta Exposition, at which I had been asked to make an address as a representative of the Negro race, as stated in the last chapter, was opened with a short address from Governor Bullock. After other interesting exercises, including an invocation from Bishop Nelson of Georgia, a dedicatory ode by Albert Howell, Jr., and addresses by the President of the Exposition and Mrs. Joseph Thompson, the President of the Women's Board, Governor Bullock introduced me with the words, we have with us today a representative of Negro enterprise and Negro civilization. When I arose to speak, there was considerable cheering, especially from the colored people. As I remember it now, the thing that was uppermost in my mind was the desire to say something that would cement the friendship of the races and bring about hearty cooperation between them. So far as my outward surroundings were concerned, the only thing that I recall distinctly now is that when I got up I saw thousands of eyes looking intently into my face. The following is the address which I delivered. Mr. President, and gentlemen of the Board of Directors and Citizens, one-third of the population of the South is of the Negro race. No enterprise seeking the material, civil, or moral welfare of this section can disregard this element of our population and reach the highest success. I but convey to you, Mr. President and Directors, the sentiment of the masses of my race when I say that in no way have the value and manhood of the American Negro been more fittingly and generously recognized than by the managers of this magnificent exposition at every stage of its progress. It is a recognition that will do more to cement the friendship of the two races than any occurrence since the dawn of our freedom. Not only this, but the opportunity here afforded will awaken among us a new era of industrial progress. Ignorant and inexperienced, it is not strange that in the first years of our new life we began at the top instead of at the bottom, that a seat in Congress or the state legislature was more sought than real estate or industrial skill, that the political convention or stump-speaking had more attractions than starting a dairy farm or a truck garden. A ship lost at sea for many days suddenly sighted a friendly vessel. From the mast of the unfortunate vessel was seen a signal, Water! Water! We die of thirst. The answer from the friendly vessel at once came back, Cast down your bucket where you are. A second time the signal, Water! Water! Send us water! ran up from the distressed vessel, and was answered, Cast down your bucket where you are. And a third and fourth signal for water was answered, Cast down your bucket where you are. The captain of the distressed vessel, at last heeding the injunction, cast down his bucket, and it came up full of fresh, sparkling water from the mouth of the Amazon River. To those of my race who depend on bettering their condition in a foreign land, or who underestimate the importance of cultivating friendly relations with the southern white man, who is their next-door neighbor, I would say, cast down your bucket where you are. Cast it down in making friends in every manly way of the people of all races by whom we are surrounded. Cast it down in agriculture, mechanics, in commerce, in domestic service, and in the professions. And in this connection it is well to bear in mind that whatever other sins the South may be called to bear, when it comes to business, pure and simple, it is in the South that the Negro is given a man's chance in the commercial world, and in nothing is this exposition more eloquent than in emphasizing this chance. Our greatest danger is that, in the great leap from slavery to freedom, we may overlook the fact that the masses of us are to live by the production of our hands, and fail to keep in mind that we shall prosper in proportion as we learn to dignify and glorify common labor, and put brains and skill into the common occupations of life, shall prosper in proportion as we learn to draw the line between the superficial and the substantial, the ornamental gugas of life, and the useful. No race can prosper till it learns that there is as much dignity in tilling a field as in writing a poem. It is at the bottom of life we must begin, and not at the top, nor should we permit our grievances to overshadow our opportunities. To those of the white race who look to the incoming of those of foreign birth and strange tongue and habits of the prosperity of the South, were I permitted, I would repeat what I say to my own race. Cast down your bucket where you are. Cast it down among the eight millions of Negroes whose habits you know, whose fidelity and love you have tested, in days when to have proved treacherous meant the ruin of your firesides. 
cast down your bucket among these people who have without strikes and labor wars tilled your fields cleared your forests builded your railroads and cities and brought forth treasures from the bowels of the earth and helped make possible this magnificent representation of the progress of the south casting down your bucket among my people helping and encouraging them as you are doing on these grounds and to education of head hand and heart you will find that they will buy your surplus land make blossom the waste places in your fields and run your factories while doing this you can be sure in the future as in the past that you and your families will be surrounded by the most patient faithful law-abiding and unresentful people that the world has seen as we have proved our loyalty to you in the past nursing your children watching by the sick bed of your mothers and fathers and often following them with tear-dimmed eyes to their graves so in the future in our humble way we shall stand by you with a devotion that no foreigner can approach ready to lay down our lives if need be in defense of yours interlacing our industrial commercial civil and religious life with yours in a way that shall make the interests of both races one in all things that are purely social we can be as separate as the fingers yet one is the hand in all things essential to mutual progress there is no defence or security for any of us except in the highest intelligence and development of all if anywhere there are efforts tending to curtail the fullest growth of the negro let these efforts be turned into stimulating encouraging and making him the most useful and intelligent citizen efforts or means so invested will pay a thousand per cent interest these efforts will be twice blessed blessing him that gives and him that takes there is no escape through law of man or god from the inevitable the laws of changeless justice bind oppressor with oppressed and close as sin and suffering joined we march to fate abreast nearly sixteen millions of hands will aid you in pulling the load upward or they will pull against you the load downward we shall constitute one-third and more of the ignorance and crime of the south or one-third its intelligence and progress we shall contribute one-third to the business and industrial prosperity of the south or we shall prove a veritable body of death stagnating depressing retarding every effort to advance the body politic gentlemen of the exposition as we present you our humble effort at an exhibition of our progress you must not expect overmuch starting thirty years ago with ownership here and there in a few quilts and pumpkins and chickens gathered from miscellaneous sources remember the path that has led from these to the inventions and production of agricultural implements buggies steam engines newspapers books statuary carving paintings the management of drug stores and banks has not been trodden without contact with thorns and thistles while we take pride in what we exhibit as a result of our independent efforts we do not for a moment forget that our part in this exhibition would fall far far short of your expectations but for the constant help that has come to our education life not only from the southern states but especially from northern philanthropists who have made their gifts a constant stream of blessing and encouragement the wisest among my race understand that the agitation of questions of social equality is the extremest folly and that progress and the enjoyment of all the privileges that will come to us must be the result of severe and constant struggle rather than of artificial forcing no race that has anything to contribute to the markets of the world is long in any degree ostracized it is important and right that all privileges of the law be ours but it is vastly more important that we be prepared for the exercises of these privileges the opportunity to earn a dollar in a factory just now is worth infinitely more than the opportunity to spend a dollar in an opera house in conclusion may i repeat that nothing in thirty years has given us more hope and encouragement and drawn us so near to you of the white race as this opportunity offered by the exposition and here bending as it were over the altar that represents the results of the struggles of your race and mine both starting practically empty-handed three decades ago i pledge that in your effort to work out the great and intricate problem which god has laid at the doors of the south you shall have at all times the patient sympathetic help of my race only let this be constantly in mind that while from the representations in these buildings of the product of field of forest of mine of factory letters and art much good will come yet far above and beyond material benefits will be that higher good that let us pray god will come in a blotting out of sectional differences and racial animosities and suspicions in a determination to administer absolute justice in a willing obedience among all classes to the mandates of law this this coupled with our material prosperity will bring into our beloved south a new heaven and a new earth 
The first thing that I remember after I had finished speaking was that Governor Bullock rushed across the platform and took me by the hand, and that others did the same. I received so many and such hearty congratulations that I found it difficult to get out of the building. I did not appreciate to any degree, however, the impression which my address seemed to have made until the next morning when I went into the business part of the city. As soon as I was recognized, I was surprised to find myself pointed out and surrounded by a crowd of men who wished to shake hands with me. This was kept up on every street onto which I went, to an extent which embarrassed me so much that I went back to my boarding place. The next morning I returned to Tuskegee. At the station in Atlanta, and at almost all of the stations at which the train stopped between that city and Tuskegee, I found a crowd of people anxious to shake hands with me. The papers in all parts of the United States published the address in full, and for months afterwards there were complimentary editorial references to it. Mr. Clark Howell, the editor of the Atlanta Constitution, telegraphed to a New York paper, among other words, the following. I do not exaggerate when I say that Professor Booker T. Washington's address yesterday was one of the most notable speeches, both as to character and as to the warmth of its reception, ever delivered to a Southern audience. The address was a revelation. The whole speech is a platform upon which blacks and whites can stand with full justice to each other. The Boston Transcript said editorially, the speech of Booker T. Washington at the Atlanta Exposition this week seems to have dwarfed all other proceedings and the exposition itself. The sensation that it has caused in the press has never been equaled. I very soon began receiving all kinds of propositions from lecture bureaus and editors of magazines and papers to take the lecture platform and to write articles. One lecture bureau offered me $50,000, or $200 a night and expenses if I would place my services at its disposal for a given period. To all these communications I replied that my life work was at Tuskegee, and that whenever I spoke it must be in the interests of Tuskegee School and my race, and that I would enter into no arrangements that seemed to place a mere commercial value upon my services. Some days after its delivery I sent a copy of my address to the President of the United States, the Honorable Grover Cleveland. I received from him the following autograph reply. Gray Gables, Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts, October 6th, 1895 Booker T. Washington, Esquire. My dear sir, I thank you for sending me a copy of your address delivered at the Atlanta Exposition. I thank you with much enthusiasm for making the address. I have read it with intense interest, and I think the exposition would be fully justified if it did not do more than furnish the opportunity for its delivery. Your words cannot fail to delight and encourage all who wish well for your race, and if our colored fellow citizens do not from your utterances gather new hope and form new determinations to gain every valuable advantage offered them by their citizenship, it will be strange indeed. Yours very truly, Grover Cleveland. Later I met Mr. Cleveland for the first time when, as president, he visited the Atlanta Exposition. At the request of myself and others, he consented to spend an hour in the Negro building, for the purpose of inspecting the Negro exhibit, and of giving the colored people in attendance an opportunity to shake hands with him. As soon as I met Mr. Cleveland, I became impressed with his simplicity, greatness, and rugged honesty. I have met him many times since then, both at, both at public functions and at his private residence in Princeton, and the more I see of him, the more I admire him. When he visited the Negro building in Atlanta, he seemed to give himself up wholly, for that hour, to the colored people. He seemed to be as careful to shake hands with some old colored auntie, clad partially in rags, and to take as much pleasure in doing so as if he were greeting some millionaire. Many of the colored people took advantage of the occasion to get him to write his name in a book or on a slip of paper. He was as careful and patient in doing this as if he were putting his signature to some great state document. Mr. Cleveland has not only shown his friendship for me in many personal ways, but has always consented to do anything I have asked of him for our school. This he has done, whether it was to make a personal donation or to use his influence in securing the donations of others. Judging from my personal acquaintance with Mr. Cleveland, I do not believe that he is conscious of possessing any color prejudice. He is too great for that. In my contact with people I find that, as a rule, it is only the little, narrow people who live for themselves, who never read good books, who do not travel, who never open up their souls in a way to permit them to come into contact with other souls, with the great outside world. No man whose vision is bounded by color can come into contact with what is highest and best in the world. In meeting men, in many places I have found that the happiest people are those who do the most for others. The most miserable are those who do the least. I have also found that few things, if any, are capable of making one so blind and narrow as race prejudice. 
I have often said to our students in the course of my talks to them on Sunday evenings in the chapel that the longer I live and the more experience I have of the world, the more I am convinced that, after all, the one thing that is most worth living for, and dying for if need be, is the opportunity of making someone else more happy and more useful. The colored people and the colored newspapers at first seemed to be greatly pleased with the character of my Atlanta address, as well as with its reception. But, after the first burst of enthusiasm began to die away, and the colored people began reading the speech in cold type, some of them seemed to feel that they had been hypnotized. They seemed to feel that I had been too liberal in my remarks toward the southern whites, and that I had not spoken out strongly enough for what they termed the rights of my race. For a while there was a reaction, so far as a certain element of my own race was concerned, but later these reactionary ones seem to have been won over to my way of believing and acting. While speaking of changes in public sentiment, I recall that about ten years after the school at Tuskegee was established, I had an experience that I shall never forget. Dr. Lyman Abbott, then the pastor of Plymouth Church and also editor of The Outlook, then the Christian Union, asked me to write a letter for his paper giving my opinion of the exact condition, mental and moral, of the colored ministers in the South as based upon my observations. I wrote the letter, giving the exact facts as I conceived them to be. The picture painted was a rather black one, or, since I am black, shall I say white? It could not be otherwise with a race but a few years out of slavery, a race which had not had time or opportunity to produce a competent ministry. What I said soon reached every Negro ministry in the country, I think, and the letters of condemnation which I received from them were not few. I think that for a year after the publication of this article, every association and every conference or religious body of any kind of my race that met did not fail before adjourning to pass a resolution condemning me, or calling upon me to retract or modify what I had said. Many of these organizations went so far in their resolutions as to advise parents to cease sending their children to Tuskegee. One association even appointed a missionary whose duty it was to warn the people against sending their children to Tuskegee. This missionary had a son in the school, and I noticed that, whatever the missionary might have said or done with regard to others, he was careful not to take his son away from the institution. Many of the colored papers, especially those that were the organs of religious bodies, joined in the general chorus of condemnation and demands for retraction. During the whole time of the excitement, and through all the criticism, I did not utter a word of explanation or retraction. I knew that I was right, and that time and the sober second thought of the people would vindicate me. It was not long before the bishops and other church leaders began to make careful investigation of the conditions of the ministry, and they found out that I was right. In fact, the oldest and most influential bishop in one branch of the Methodist Church said that my words were far too mild. Very soon public sentiment began making itself felt in demanding a purifying of the ministry. While this is not yet complete by any means, I think I may say, without egotism, and I have been told by many of our most influential ministers, that my words had much to do with starting a demand for the placing of a higher type of men in the pulpit. I have had the satisfaction of having many who once condemned me thank me heartily for my frank words. The change of the attitude of the Negro ministry, so far as regards myself, is so complete that at the present time I have no warmer friends among any class than I have among the clergymen. The improvement in the character and life of the Negro ministers is one of the most gratifying evidences of the progress of the race. My experience with them, as well as other events in my life, convinced me that the thing to do, when one feels sure that he has said or done the right thing, and is condemned, is to stand still and keep quiet. If he is right, time will show it. In the midst of the discussion which was going on concerning my Atlanta speech, I received the letter which I give below from Dr. Gilman, the president of Johns Hopkins University, who had been made chairman of the judges of award in connection with the Atlanta Exposition. Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore. President's Office, September 30th, 1895. Dear Mr. Washington, would it be agreeable to you to be one of the judges of award in the Department of Education at Atlanta? If so, I shall be glad to place your name upon the list. A line by telegraph will be welcomed. Yours very truly, D.C. Gilman. I think I was even more surprised to receive this invitation than I had been to receive the invitation to speak at the opening of the exposition. It was to be part of my duty, as one of the jurors, to pass not only upon the exhibits of the colored schools, but also upon those of the white schools. I accepted the position and spent a month in Atlanta in performance of the duties which it entailed. 
the board of jurors was a large one containing in all of sixty members it was about equally divided between southern white people and northern white people among them were college presidents leading scientists and men of letters and specialists in many subjects when the group of jurors to which i was assigned met for organization mr thomas nelson page who was one of the number moved that i be made secretary of that division and the motion was unanimously adopted nearly half of our division were southern people in performing my duties in the inspection of the exhibits of white schools i was in every case treated with respect and at the close of our labors i parted from my associates with regret i am often asked to express myself more freely than i do upon the political condition and the political future of my race these recollections of my experience in atlanta give me the opportunity to do so briefly my own belief is although i have never before said so in so many words that the time will come when the negro in the south will be accorded all the political rights which his ability character and material possessions entitle him to i think though that the opportunity to freely exercise such political rights will not come in any large degree through outside or artificial forcing but will be accorded to the negro by the southern white people themselves and that they will protect him in the exercise of those rights just as soon as the south gets over the old feeling that it is being forced by foreigners or aliens to do something which it does not want to do i believe that the change in the direction that i have indicated is going to begin in fact there are indications that it is already beginning in a slight degree let me illustrate my meaning suppose that some months before the opening of the atlanta exposition there had been a general demand from the press and public platform outside the south that a negro be given a place on the opening program and that a negro be placed upon the board of jurors of award would any such recognition of the race have taken place i do not think so the atlanta officials went as far as they did because they felt it to be a pleasure as well as a duty to reward what they considered merit in the negro race say what we will there is something in human nature which we cannot blot out which makes one man in the end recognize and reward merit in another regardless of color or race i believe it is the duty of the negro as the greater part of the race is already doing to deport himself modestly in regard to political claims depending upon the slow but sure influences that proceed from the possession of property intelligence and high character for the full recognition of his political rights i think that the according of the full exercise of political rights is going to be a matter of natural slow growth not an overnight gourd vine affair i do not believe that the negro should cease voting for a man cannot learn the exercise of self-government by ceasing to vote any more than a boy can learn to swim by keeping out of the water but i do believe that in his voting he should more and more be influenced by those of intelligence and character who are his next-door neighbors i know colored men who through the encouragement help and advice of southern white people have accumulated thousands of dollars worth of property but who at the same time would never think of going to those same persons for advice concerning the casting of their ballots this it seems to me is unwise and unreasonable and should cease in saying this i do not mean that the negro should truckle or not vote from principle for the instant he ceases to vote from principle he loses the confidence and respect of the southern white man even i do not believe that any state should make a law that permits an ignorant and poverty-stricken white man to vote and prevents a black man in the same condition from voting such a law is not only unjust but it will react as all unjust laws do in time for the effect of such a law is to encourage the negro to secure education and property and at the same time it encourages the white man to remain in ignorance and poverty i believe that in time through the operation of intelligence and friendly race relations all cheating at the ballot box in the south will cease it will become apparent that the white man who begins by cheating a negro out of his ballot soon learns to cheat a white man out of his and that the man who does this ends his career of dishonesty by the theft of property or by some equally serious crime in my opinion the time will come when the south will encourage all of its citizens to vote it will see that it pays better from every standpoint to have healthy vigorous life than to have that political stagnation which always results when one half of the population has no share and no interest in the government as a rule i believe in universal free suffrage but i believe that in the south we are confronted with peculiar conditions that justify the protection of the ballot in many of the states for a while at least either by an education test a property test or by both combined but whatever tests are required they should be made to apply with equal and exact justice to both races end of chapter fourteen the atlanta exposition address recording by preston mcconkey annabella utah